Rachel, uh, the last 12 to 24 months, it has been impossible to ignore CRISPR. Um, and I was hoping, I know that uh, for the lay public, a lot of us know that this is a gene editing technique. And we know that in some deep sense, it's been borrowed directly from nature. Um, but as someone who worked on the team that helped to invent this technique and has now runs one of four companies looking to exploit it, can you give me a sense of how it actually works? Sure, so the, the CRISPR gene editing technique is basically based on a little protein called Cas9 that you can think of as a pair of molecular scissors. It comes in and is able to cut the DNA at a very particular site, a site chosen by the scientist, and that lets you then take out or add in a few pieces of DNA. You can kind of think of it like a word processor. It's the ability to go into a text file and maybe take out a word, change the spelling of a word, or insert a whole new sentence at a particular place in the manuscript. When you look back at, at the longer history of biotech, which is not, it's not all that long, depending on what counts as biotech, but where does this technique uh, rank in terms of sort of big leaps forward in the field? Yeah, it's, it's one of the small handful of technologies, I think, that's rapidly and dramatically changing biology and basic research. Um, we've seen just in the past few years since this technology first really came to, to the world um, through a, a major publication in 2012, there are now thousands of labs around the world that have adopted this technology for how they do their basic research. And I think you can count on one hand the number of other techniques that have been adopted that quickly. I think PCR is, is probably one of them. Um, it was uh, invented a few decades ago and really brought us into the modern era of molecular biology. Um, I, I want to stay with biotech for just a second, and then we'll get back to CRISPR. Um, I've been dying to ask you, what do you make of the whole Theranos situation, and how has that changed the field? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, we, I almost never hear about Theranos when I'm talking with our investors, when I'm at various biotech meetings. Um, it's been almost a non-conversation point in the biotech world. But I live in the Bay Area, obviously the hotbed of the tech world as well. And so anytime I'm out with tech friends for, for dinner or something, that's the first question they ask is, <laughs> what's going on at Theranos? You know, what, what's happening there? Is that going to affect your company? Um, and I think when we look at the investors who backed that company and some of the key leaders inside and advising that company. It's a really distinct group of people um, outside of the, the traditional biotech world. Um, and you know, I, I think they behaved in ways that are, are different from some other biotech companies. You know, certainly, um, many science companies are uh, very public about the scientific work that they do, go to conferences and share their, their research, publish their research. Um, and that's not something that we saw Theranos doing. Hmm. Um, okay, getting back to Caribou. Uh, uh, our title here is What's Next? And so give us a sense for some of the really interesting applications, surprising applications that you're seeing or that you guys are developing. Yeah, I'm, I'm incredibly excited about some of the therapeutic, the health applications for this technology. Um, in principle, you can use the CRISPR-Cas9 system to go into a patient's cells and directly fix mutation causing uh, mutations that cause disease. So for example, sickle cell anemia mm. is caused by just a single mutation in the hemoglobin gene and causes uh, a really unfortunate disease that has no, no treatment or cure today. Um, and so there are many groups who are looking at how you can use gene editing to correct that mutation in a patient's own blood stem cells in a way to potentially cure that disease. I, I think that's phenomenally exciting. Would you say that most of the public curiosity um, around CRISPR is, is about these therapeutic approaches? I think that's certainly what's getting the majority of the attention right now, is the ability to, to modify our own genomes to have a, a direct impact on our health. But of course, it's, it's not the only one. Um, and really any market that has bio-based products, whether it's agriculture or industry, will be transformed by gene editing. Uh, as something of a, a kind of chubby guy, um, I'm really interested in how CRISPR is going to affect food. <laughs> um, can, can you tell me uh, what we can expect there? Sure. Uh, we're already seeing some really exciting work done by a number of groups. Um, there are some researchers at Penn State who recently, using CRISPR, made a new type of mushroom 
um, that doesn't brown as quickly uh, and in principle can r result in less food waste as the food is able to have a longer shelf life. Um, a project that we're involved in at Caribou is a collaboration with a British company called Genus and they're one of the leading companies in the animal livestock space and we're working with them to use this technology to breed a new line of pigs that's resistant to a particular virus. Um, that virus has no cure today and results in the death of many, many pigs every year and major losses of hundreds of millions of dollars to farmers in the U.S. Um, didn't a scientist recently eat uh, a sort of CRISPR edited uh, cabbage? I, I think right? so. There's some great photos in the media of uh, someone's home kitchen. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> have you uh, had the occasion to taste any CRISPR? I have CRISPR? not tasted any CRISPR okay. food yet. No. Oh, okay. um, have you heard any reports back? Does it taste funny? Does it taste uh, good? <clears throat> what I'm hearing is that it's just fine. <laughs> um, so there is this ongoing patent war uh, over CRISPR, um, principally between a group at the Broad Institute at MIT and the team that you were on at Berkeley. Um, tell us a bit about, it, about that and how it could sort of affect your business or the future of kind of this technique. Sure. You know, I, I think we've seen this story in biotech before. There's an exciting <coughs> new technology. A number of groups move very quickly, and there end up being uh, competing claims at various patent offices around the world. So what's happening right now is what's called an interference proceeding, um, which is part of the, the old version of the law. Patent law has changed, and so we won't see many more of these again. But it's the U.S. Patent Office's way of determining who actually invented something first. Uh, it's a very long process, and so we're, we're, we're watching as, as it proceeds right now. It only just started earlier this year. Um, and is there, so what would happen if they decided against the Berkeley Group? Sure. Um, you know, Caribou has taken the approach of a very diversified process as we think about IP. We've brought in a lot of uh, intellectual property from various other groups, uh, universities, companies, and we've continued to develop a lot of IP ourselves. Uh, we have a very innovative group, um, and even just in our, our short for few years, already have multiple U.S. patents that have issued to the company. Okay, you're hedged. <laughs> um, so uh, you left academia, obviously. You were on this team at Berkeley. Uh, you were doing this groundbreaking basic research, and then uh, you went to the private sector uh, to be CEO of this wonderful company. Um, what was the decision process uh, like for that, and do you miss academia at all? You know, I, I always <coughs> knew that I wanted to be on the industry side of science, mm -hmm. and I really wasn't sure how to get from point A to point B. And as it became clear that a lot of what we and my colleagues were doing in the lab was directly commercially relevant, um, my <laughs> co-founder and my then thesis advisor, Jennifer Doudna, and I and a few others not only got really excited about what the potential possibilities were from a commercial perspective, but we started to convince ourselves that we could do it. Um, and from a professional perspective, I couldn't have thought of a, a better, more exciting way to move from academia into industry. Um, I feel like I still get to kind of have my cake and eat it too. There's a lot of uh, early cutting edge R&D that we're doing at the company. And so I still have a frontline seat to some really amazing science, uh, but in a way that we always have that focus of what is the commercial application, what's the product, where can we apply this to help improve our community. Um, I'm curious, you said that you always wanted uh, to go into the commercial side, how come? You know, I, I think it's that last piece that I just mentioned. I really liked the idea of how science can have a direct impact on, on our world. Um, I loved the basic research that I did, um, but it, it always felt a few steps removed from a, a direct impact on those around me. And what has been sort of the most surprising thing uh, about kind of leaving academia and then being out in this different world? Well, you know, I, I think a lot of people like to think about um, you know, in, in academia, it's so hard. You always have to write grants to get your work funded, and, and so, you know, go to companies instead. Uh, but, of course, the first thing I did for the company was write grants to bring some money in, mm -hmm. and uh, I've been fundraising for the company ever since. And so I, I think there are actually a lot more similarities between the day-to-day -day of, of academia and industry. I think the, the goal and the focus is different, but it's, it's a lot of the same skills. Sure. Um, one of the ethical worries that people have about CRISPR or, or any time they hear gene, gene editing, and they've been hearing it now for 30, 40, 50 years, um, <clears throat> is the worry that at some point it will be compulsory, uh, that you will have to 
edit your own genome or edit the genome of your children, uh, be, not because the law tells you to, but in order to, say, compete economically. Um, do you worry about that? You know, at, at Caribou, we've, we've taken a pretty straightforward approach to genome editing and embryos, and we've just drawn a hard line and said, that's not a place we're going, and it's not a place that any of our partners or licensees can go either. Um, you know, as, as I look at um, why someone might want to modify the, the genome of an embryo, um, it often falls into two camps. One would be trying to prevent transmission of an inherited disease, and there are many ways that you can avoid that. Um, you can adopt a child. Um, that's, a, that's a clear way to prevent transmission. Um, and you can also use other techniques that are tried and true in in vitro fertilization clinics that allow you to analyze embryos before they're ever implanted to choose ones who already don't have that, that mutation. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the second driver is uh, to, to create humans with enhanced capabilities. Um, but I think the reality is our genetics are, are so tremendously complex, there isn't mm -hmm. one gene that, that makes any of those traits possible. And we simply don't understand the biology of the complexity of all of those different genes and how they make us who we are today. Yeah, I, I worry about that too. Uh, do, you, do you wonder if, um, you know, something like intelligence, for instance, uh, works with, in concert with, you know, tons and tons of genes, um, and all interacting with the environment at once? Is there a perception that you find among lay people a lot that are like, oh, great, we can edit the genome, well, you know, let's fire it right up? Yes, and I, I think the scientific community has an obligation to explain that it, it's not that simple. Yeah. Um, you know, even something like height has many genes that contribute to controlling how short or tall we are. Um, you know, there's no one intelligence gene. Um, we're, we're very, very complicated organisms with a very complicated blueprint. When do you expect uh, CRISPR will become real for people? Um, right now, it's, it's, there's been several kind of false starts with genetics, right, where people have been kind of not promised, but just have had this kind of expectation based on uh, some of what we've done in the media, certainly. Uh, but then uh, just uh, thinking that this, this day is going to come where people are going to be able to have all these fancy new products and uh, they have not arrived, maybe not. Um, when is it going to be, what's going to be the big proof of concept for this technology? Sure. Um, you know, I think it'll come in a couple of different ways. I think on the healthcare side, we're going to see some of the first trials uh, of using this technology in humans in the next couple of years. Um, there have been media reports that there's a trial that kicked off actually last month in China, um, and there are some academic groups here in the United States who are preparing their plans for their, their first trial to use this in an oncology setting. Mm. Um, I think there are a number of companies who are starting to uh, plant a flag that their trials are coming in the next few years as well. And so we're, we're really going to see CRISPR used in humans in a very short period of time. Um, I think on the agriculture side, we've already seen some really nice examples. Um, you know, those products aren't commercially available yet, uh, but they've, they've shown that it, it really works and, and you really get the product at the end that has that desired outcome. Can I ask you uh, about oncology briefly? Um, cancer is obviously something that touches uh, most people, if not personally, uh, uh, loved ones and other people that are close to them. Uh, is CRISPR something that could help? I know immunotherapy is taking off uh, in cancer treatment. Could CRISPR help there? Yes, and in fact, I believe both the Chinese trial and the academic trial here in the United States are both using CRISPR in an oncology setting. Um, specifically using CRISPR to modify T cells or other immune cells to then help reprogram them to actually target the cancer and defeat the cancer inside the patient's own body. Wow. Um, you mentioned uh, agriculture. Uh, does that mean that we might see sort of uh, better sculpted pets? <laughs> uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, it's, I think it's a really interesting question of, of how and where this can be used not just in humans, but in, in all other animals as well. And I think the same thing applies there. You know, the, the genetics of dogs or of cats are also incredibly complicated. Sure. Um, and so it's, it's a lot, it's not very easy to go straight from idea to genetic manipulation to uh, a new animal that has a particular trait. We've been talking about all these kind of uh, pie in the sky applications. And so I wanna bring it back to kind of the practical nitty gritty 
what are the big challenges for you guys right now to the extent that they're legible to a layperson uh, like me and maybe some of the people in our audience? Sure, uh, sure. you know, I, I think some of the, the challenges are, are really just about taking this technology and using it in ways that uh, directly improve or, or solve problems that are available today. I think in the therapeutics world, that's, that's really quite obvious and we're seeing a lot of groups really grab the bull by the horns and really dive into the traditional drug development process as they're measuring the efficacy of this technology and as they're measuring the specificity of it as well. Of course, safety is absolutely critical. And so we and many of our partners are focused uh, very carefully on making sure that the technology is safe and uh, relevant for the appropriate application and developing new tools and new uh, genomics capabilities to really make those measurements in ways that have never been possible before. And how quickly is the turnover on some of these experiments? Like, is this, is this a field with a really fast learning curve? It's been an amazingly fast learning curve. You know, in the past four years, there's been an absolute explosion. Um, the specifics always rely on what you're working on. If you're working in a human cell, for example, it, uh, its generation time is quite short. You can grow it pretty easily in a dish in the lab. And so you're able to very quickly get answers in a matter of days or weeks. Um, but with, say, a plant that might have a three or six month generation time, mm -hmm. it's a little bit slower to go from um, early experiment to outcome and then starting the process again. Um, before we wrap up, I wanted to ask you again about uh, biotech as a field. Um, I've read that this is a field that is actually friendlier to women than, than others. Uh, the, I think the executive pay gap is smaller uh, than in most places, but most of the executives are still men. Uh, what has it been like for you to kind of navigate that larger world? Yeah, you know, I, I have to commend biotech. We're, we're doing better than others, um, mm. but at the same level, there's still a lot of work yet to be done uh, to achieve gender parity. Um, I feel on a personal level incredibly lucky. There are very few instances where I feel that I've been treated in a way that I didn't particularly like because of my gender. Mm -hmm. um, there are certainly times where I've been treated in ways that I didn't like because of my age. Um, and I think that's something that biotech has to work on as well. But it, it's certainly an industry that I think is constantly working to uh, improve that. And you know, I, I encourage any uh, girl or woman who's interested in STEM to consider the life sciences. It's a, it's a phenomenal place, incredibly exciting place, and a world where companies are doing fascinating things. Are you able, uh, I know that you must be amazingly busy in this job, but are you able to kind of give back at, at a mentorship level to younger women who are trying to pursue this? That's a great question. I try to get involved in various ways, um, whether it's at UC Berkeley or through other local organizations to speak to groups of, of girls, uh, to biology students, uh, to women in the industry, industry groups in the Bay Area. I think it's incredibly important. Um, people have given me so much in terms of mentorship and I feel that I owe a tremendous amount to the community. Rachel, thank you for being with us today. This thank you, wonderful. Ross. I appreciate it.